Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming today. Um, get my notes out. Uh, yeah, welcome to Dada Fest International 2022 Hybrid. Uh, the festival has been running um, events in person and online since the 26th of October, and this is our last in-person event. My name is Ngozi Ugochuku. I am a black woman wearing a dress, which is very unusual for me, uh, with pink, green, white, and black shapes on it, uh, with a white hat and green shoes. I'm a multidisciplinary artist, and I've been asked by Dada to introduce the speaker for the Edward Rushton Social Justice lecture. So yeah, thank you for coming today on the UN International Day of Persons with Disability. Dada have been holding this event, um, these lectures, for eight years and I feel honoured to be, be asked to host it today. Um, I'd like to thank the Museum, Liverpool, sorry, the Museum in Liverpool, uh, one of the host festivals for one of the host uh, venues for the, for the festival. I'd also like to thank the Arts Council for the funding. Kayarani Baraka is a writer, poet and artist. She is a practice-based researcher whose work centres dis disability justice and anti-colonial practice. Among her honours, she uh, was the modern poet in translation at the inaugural Poet in Residence, the first non-British associate artist in the UK at the UK's National Centre for Writing. And, and, and an NYU Trist Development Departmental uh, Fellow and is currently UK Associate Artist at the Daphne Foundation and Research Fellow at the University of Art, Arts in London. A quote I read about her is about Karani, expect to laugh, think, and I greatly admire this artist. I couldn't agree more, so please put your hands together for this year's Edward Rushton Social Justice Festa Lecture with Karani Baraka. Thank you, Thank you so much, Goz. Towards the body mind as uncolony, part one. What came before? Hello, Samwanya. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much to Dada Fest for inviting me here to the Liverpool Museum for hosting and to all of you here in this space and in the ether. <laughs> I'm an Indonesian woman with brown skin and short black hair, wearing lipstick, earrings and a bracelet and a dress uh, with red, brown and black abstract patterning and boots. A couple of things off the bat. The first is that although my language, Indonesian, has no tenses, whether something is past, present, or future depends on context. And there's also the possibility that something exists in more than one tense. Because this talk is in English, it will begin with the past, then go to the present, then towards the future. And in doing so, I hope to underscore the idea that all of these tenses are inseparable from each other. Secondly, this is a talk I would like to anchor in joy. To begin with joy, to remember joy in the midst of, and to end with you in a joy steeped in togetherness. As disabled and or deaf people around the world, we are no strangers to systemic adversity. Billions of us struggle to survive day to day, increasingly so in late stage capitalism, a term I will certainly discuss today and explain from a disabled perspective in this talk. And though I was tempted to begin this lecture delving into the heart of suffering, I wanted to try to be kind to all of you and to myself <laughs> and begin by imagining how it must feel to be completely free. What a state of maximum possible joy would feel like. For angling our body minds towards this feeling communally is the point of what I'd like to say here today. In a very bodily way, how would all our senses feel true freedom? The crux of our various communities ethos is that each of our body minds is so very different and I cannot presume to tell you what music the specific frequencies of complete liberation would feel like in your flesh. To me at least, freedom is an ease from all unnecessary tension in the body, including a freedom from the persistent tensions and disruptions of fictional social hierarchies that mean suffering or pleasure, 
life or death for different peoples based on cruel norms. Freedom always embraces love, and love is expansive, is in relationship to others. Being free alone is not nearly as fun as shared liberation. Freedom for the so-called self means my loved ones are also free and loved and supported and shown immeasurable grace and kindness in our short, short lives here on earth. Let's try to focus on what joyful freedom feels like. If you're sighted and feel comfortable doing so, please close your eyes. For the next 30 seconds, let's all just be still and embody joyful freedom. Joyful freedom enveloping our heads and our chests and all the other body parts we may have. Just a warm ocean of joy and liberatedness. You may all now open your eyes if you've been closing them and re-enter the room. Thank you for that. That feeling and deepening it is the point of this talk. Throughout this lecture, I'd like to keep layering on to your definitions of joy as liberation, adding definitions that perhaps you have known all your life, in which case, I hope this lecture is received by you as a gesture of solidarity and communality, rather than any assumption that you have been unaware of these definitions, or perhaps definitions that you are learning about for the first time here. So, now that we begin to acknowledge this glorious possibility of liberation as felt emotion, as physical sensation, as intellectual concept fully embodied, how do we get from where we are now to this state of being for ourselves more often, as often as possible and for all? How do we gesture and move towards that glow and how do we do so without hurting ourselves or each other anymore? If anything in this talk is difficult for you emotionally, I want you to remember that towardsness, to take comfort in the journey towards joy, to know that all the cruel realities I will be describing are conveyed to contrast what is with what can and should be, which is to say, a present in which we are all liberated. We do not experience full liberation in the present because we, certainly we in this room today in this moment, and I believe you watching as well elsewhere, exist within the brutal present of colonization. The brutal, and I must emphasize this once again, not merely past, but present. What is colonization? Simply put, it's theft. Theft of life, theft of land, theft of language and of the arts themselves, theft of names, theft of safety, theft of freedom from unnecessary pain, theft of joy. And deaf and or disabled people have been witness to all of it and deeply wounded by it and also made complicit in it, as we all are today. Despite the fact that many of us, I'm sure, sport the latest fashion styles and are up with Gen Z lingo, we disabled people are not a new invention. We, what the world now calls disabled people in English, we've certainly existed before the invention of what we now know as the English language, before any contemporary manifestation of language was birthed from previous forms of language. We have been around. <laughs> as a disabled woman from Indonesia, who is a migrant here and who truly hates the term voice of the voiceless, as though those of us from stolen from communities need any kind of savior to speak for us. I can only speak from my own perspective. So I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey, a travel through time that I think about most often. The journey of how we got from back then to right now and how colonialism has shaped it. How is it that you're finding yourself listening here to me, a very awkward person, speaking into a microphone in Liverpool, who was born in the city of Jakarta, Indonesia, yet somehow speaks as though I'm a bookseller from New England, USA? By the way, New England, there's a colonial place name if there ever was, wasn't there? In order to bring you deeper into my vision of our collective joy, here is just one disabled person's view of history, of colonization as theft, how it began and how it persists. For every day, very quietly, like many millions, I must reckon with how colonization disabled me and continues to injure both myself and my disabled communities in Indonesia, in the UK and elsewhere. We begin on dearly beloved islands 
What we now know is the nation state of Indonesia, where I'm from, is a group of over 17,000 islands. It is the country with the longest coastline in the world because of these islands. And despite what many Western maps will tell you, it is about as wide as the United States. Many people in the West I've spoken to are surprised to learn that Indonesia has the fourth largest population in the world, about 275 million people. A theft of dignity often comes in the form of minimizing, in this case, making smaller the entirety of what one is. Indonesia has over 700 different languages and cultures, each with its own history through the millennia. There have been many different kinds of government, including various kingdoms, religious systems, Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, hundreds of kinds of indigenous, etc., and ways that culture, language, and faith and the arts evolved. Different waves of migration to these islands from what is now Vietnam, what is now India, from what is now the Republic of China, from what is now Yemen, and many more places besides created all the different Indonesian peoples we are. This is why the largest Buddhist temple on earth, Borobudur, is on the Indonesian island of Java. It's why Bali is a Hindu island. It's why I have an Arabic name and my sibling has a Sanskrit one. People existed as stewards to many hundreds of different biomes, which are essentially geographically bound communities of living things. Different songs, stories, visual art forms, dances arose from living in these very different biomes before European colonialism. Now, very many forms of inequality and hierarchies existed before European colonization of Indonesia. A kingdom, after all, is a hierarchy in itself. But what gives me hope is that there were just as many names for and concepts for disabilities in each language and culture. And many of them, I choose to believe, were far more advanced in equality for us than contemporary versions in the Western world. For instance, two cultures that I identify as belonging to are Javanese and Minang. Minang culture is the largest matrilineal culture in the world, meaning the bloodline runs through women, and traditionally we are the ones who can inherit land and property. And Javanese culture has disabled gods. Already here, the best parts of my inherited cultures reflect a sophistication the Western world has not often recognized within us, a recognition of the divine and disabled people and the power of women and the best of these, these cultures do not reflect the patriarchal, ableist, colonial world they have been forced to conform to. In the 16th century, European, quote, exploration and discovery, end quote, began in and around my aforementioned beloved islands, which meant plunder, theft. In our case, to gain control of spices, as apparently the food in Europe was quite bland. Theft, which is the bedrock of colonization, quote, discovery, end quote, of places like what is now known as Australia, which belongs to the many First Nations communities that land was viciously and violently stolen from. People who, prior to European so-called discovery, had been trading peacefully with people from what is now called Indonesia. Europeans, quote, unquote, discovered nothing here. <laughs> and in what is now called Indonesia, all manner of Europeans began to thieve from us claiming our territories as theirs, forcing our ancestors to yield through brutal violence and assault. Whether the British, the French, the Portuguese, or the Dutch, though the Dutch staked their claim for the longest time. And the very seed of the vastly inhumane system known as colonial capitalism began to be hatched on a larger scale, precisely on my aforementioned beloved islands, in what was then known as the Dutch East Indies. For the Dutch East Indies Company was the world's first mega corporation associated with the government, operating under the same violent means as today's mega corporations, oil companies like Shell and mining companies like Freeport McMoran, both still very active in the same islands. They cut down and shipped off rainforests to build Europe. They forced people off our lands. They forced people to give up our languages and ways of life. They violently imposed Christianity. And the Dutch imposed human slavery in what is now Indonesia for two centuries. These are all processes that were also happening to the indigenous peoples of North and South America. In Africa, of course, with transatlantic slavery as a brutal cornerstone of the colonialism that was happening nearly everywhere on the continent, as mentioned in what is now known as Australia, in other parts of Asia, in what is now known as the Middle East. And by the way, try looking up the origins of these regions' names on colonial maps. The Far East, quote unquote, is only the Far East if your vantage point is England, after all. Of course, for the majority world, as I like to refer to us, rather than the European white minority, 
none of this is news. There is no such thing as a developing country, as Walter Rodney's book, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, will tell you, as billions of people around the world will tell you. There are only historically stolen from communities and historic thieves. And as I'll discuss a bit later, there are certainly countries that are both, including my own. Disabled and or deaf people were not merely witnesses to all of this colonization. It must be re-emphasized. Just like anyone else, disabled people fought for our lives and our families. We fought against enslavement. Throughout everything, deaf and or disabled peoples in the now Indonesian archipelago were forced to try to hide deafness and or disability for fear of more suffering, or could not possibly hide deafness and or disability and suffered more for it. And throughout everything, Disabled and deaf peoples created art and were part of art. The likelihood this art survived, was kept safe, and was distributed was made much smaller by the fact that we were deaf and or disabled, however it was created. We existed throughout these long centuries of brutality and did all the human things, loved, created, throughout. In fact, as my colleague Slamet Amex Tohari's research states, and as I have known all my life, but fully understood only in adulthood, Javanese people had and continue to have disabled gods and depictions of these disabled gods in art. In a little while, I will tell you what happened to this indigenous culture of celebrating disabled people as closer to the divine. After hundreds of years of violent struggle of people being turned into political prisoners, exiled to other continents, which is why you have people from what is now Indonesia in Sri Lanka, South Africa, and Suriname, all former Dutch colonies as well. After being assaulted, after being forced into saying there were only two genders and one way to love, after having family stolen from us, having all our possessions taken, our rainforests and mangroves and oceans and rivers plundered, Indonesia became independent in 1945. In order to achieve this independence, thousands of islands and hundreds of cultures had, be, had to be subsumed under the title of Indonesia to provide a united front. However, two short decades later, colonialism reared its ugly head again, and this time in diabolical fashion using its old tactics to create yet another genocide. During the previous centuries of colonization, the Dutch and other European nations used the tactic of divide et impera, divide and rule, to turn all of our hundreds of cultures against each other, so we would be too busy fighting among ourselves to tackle the overarching European enemies. This time, in 1965, they did so again. With the backing and military support of the Western nations, including arms from the United Kingdom and a hit list supplied by the US, a military dictatorship seized power in Indonesia and killed off what would grow to be about two million people in the name of quote-unquote anti-communism. The people who were killed in this genocide were not only suspected communists, including labor organizers, but ethnic, sexual, and gender minorities, anyone considered a social threat or socially inferior. This includes, of course, deaf and or disabled people. This also includes anyone who was a feminist organizer. In the 1960s, before this genocide, the largest feminist movement in the world was in Indonesia. We native women had been organizing national women's conferences from the 1920s, even under Dutch colonialism. With the 1965 to 1966 genocide, the largest feminist movement in the world was literally killed off because we were deemed leftists, killed in violent fashion orchestrated by Western governments. These kinds of 20th century genocides and government overthrows in the name of the Cold War in favor of capitalist military dictatorships were also going on widely elsewhere, from Chile to Iran. The 65-66 genocide instituted General Suharto in a military capitalist dictatorship, allowing the West to seize power over our resources once again, this time through multinational corporations like the aforementioned Shell and Freeport McMoran. Their stranglehold has never left. And this violent military capitalist dictatorship lasted until 1998, leaving physical and or emotional scars on all of us old enough to remember living in it. However, none of us who call ourselves Javanese are colonized alone. Java is the most densely populated island in Indonesia, and especially under Suharto's military capitalist dictatorship, we are the colonizers of other islands. Furthermore, the Indonesian government, especially under the Western-backed military dictatorship, has been past colonizer of places like East Timor 
and is the current colonizer of Papuan territories. Colonialism begets more colonialism. So I was born in the 1980s in a hospital in Jakarta, Indonesia, um, that was known for having one really delicious satay street vendor parked outside it. Like everyone birthed in Indonesia for the 33 years that General Suharto was president, I was born into a dictatorship that was the result of a history of continued colonialism. We Javanese people still have disabled gods, but because our understanding of disabled people as closer to the divine was violently stamped out by Dutch missionary hospitals and the medical model of disability brought by Europeans, I was born into a land where disabled people remain deeply marginalized. When my father got a scholarship to study in the US, I joined him for that time before we moved back to Indonesia. And so at the age of three, I became bilingual. And that is why I sound like a bookseller from New England. The fact that education was understood to be better in Western countries and that Western countries are able to provide scholarships to people from elsewhere and that English has become a sign of the middle and upper classes and stolen from countries is all a function of colonialism. The fact that when I got my own scholarship to study in the States and came back home to Indonesia, Indonesians were consistently paid lower rates than so-called expats, AKA migrants deluxe. Even those of us Indonesians who got Western educations is also a function of colonialism. That we who are Western educated were routinely paid more than those of us who went to Indonesian universities and those who went to universities were paid more than those who did not go to a Western sanctioned institute of higher education is also all a result of colonialism as is the fact that many of us become disabled from the stress of having to leave our countries and families for the chance of a more economically viable life. Let's take a moment to remember how joy feels in our body minds again before we continue. So please close your eyes if you can and 10 seconds of that warm cloud of joy again. Five, four, three, two, one. Part two, towardsness. So now we find ourselves in the so-called present. Now here we are in Liverpool, England, where the docks traded in humanity itself, stole children from parents and lovers from each other, forced people to do unimaginable things, which if perpetrated at all for even one minute would be unconscionable, but was done over a hundred years and a hundred after that and more. The law forced people to give birth to life begotten by force with the understanding that life, these babies, were to be viewed as others' property their entire lives. Once again, I say all this not to assume you don't know this already, but if you do, to show you you are not alone in thinking about these things all the time. And here we are in the UK, where not only do most people not know that slavery existed for two centuries in Indonesia, not only do people not know that Indonesia was once, during what was called the British Interregnum period, a colony of the United Kingdom, not only do people not know that we contain the most Muslims in the world and have various histories of Muslim feminism that were literally killed off by colonial machinations, not only do people largely not know where Indonesia is on a map or that Bali is just one island in it, not only do people here not know that Javanese people have disabled gods, and that the medical model brought by Europeans destroyed societies where we were treated as closer to the divine. But most British disabled people do not know that I as a disabled migrant and many other disabled migrants are not entitled access to any public funds, any. This means that a migrant here in the UK is either someone quote unquote abled who does not need access to public funds, someone who is taken care of by others, or someone who has to work as was the case for me through near continuous relapsing of extreme pain. Because the alternative to exist in my stolen from country where public healthcare systems have been gutted by colonialism and where until just recently, my regular medication was wildly prohibitively expensive to buy as opposed to in the UK was actually worse. This means a disabled migrant such as myself must choose to leave the people I love on the other side of the world to try to survive alone, this is before I met my husband, <laughs> though that attempt itself would compound my complex PTSD. This means that disabled migrants who are women or gender non-conforming people of the majority world, and studies have shown that in Western countries, the more non-white you are coded as being, the less likely people think you are in pain. This means that we must suffer through innumerable instances of being denied healthcare in hospitals of actually being abused and berated by healthcare institutions at a much higher rate than white disabled people. We disabled artists of the majority world must shape a career with disabled artists and arts organizations from the minority world, so-called developed countries. 
in which our disabled bodies are treated with far less care than that of white counterparts, not always followed by apologies, and where we are subject to hearing countless so-called microaggressions from white disabled colleagues about disabled people from the third world and developing countries. While I live with the bodily knowledge that my culture in which there are disabled gods has been decimated and made ableist by their cultures. Colonialism has shaped the way we disabled people exist in the UK, even for those of you who are not migrants. Of course, if you're Scottish or Irish or Welsh, just like me as a, disa as a Javanese person, your histories are of being both colonizer and colonized. And in the present, according to a scope study, though the most likely UK demographic to claim disabled status is white, the demographic with the highest rates of disability are British Asian, and the demographic most negatively impacted by ableism are black British people. This is why we must reject a singular understanding of disability, because our experiences are all different and shaped by colonial histories and the present. How we define environmental and climate crisis, the latter of which is already affecting disabled peoples and the most stolen from countries and colonial states is a product of colonial genocides. The colonial definition of Anthropocene is that the period we are now in of human history in which human activity has altered the earth profoundly to environmental detriment. And this period supposedly began with the industrial revolution around a century ago. However, the anti-colonial definition of Anthropocene that many more people should actually recognize is that it should be counted from the beginnings of European colonialism 500 years ago, causing the stripping of the environment around the world for so-called natural resources and the genocide of indigenous peoples who had been stewarding the environment, taking care of it in harmony for thousands of years. The very definition of what art is in Indonesia how it is supported and by whom, including for deaf and or disabled people in the art world, is defined by continued colonial capitalism. So-called traditional arts, especially those that have communal or spiritual value, have been increasingly devalued, and in certain parts you are more likely to see these performed for tourists rather than be part of enriching community in non-monetary form. And this is part and parcel of centuries-old illusion-making. The late Indonesian artist, S. Sujoyono, coined the term Moi Indi, or Beautiful Indies, in Dutch. In order to portray the Dutch East Indies as a paradise, um, which is what the Dutch policy was, rather than a place of mass murder, slavery, environmental destruction, and dispossession. Moi Indi arts is a big part of why today people will flock to Bali as a paradise destination, and many fewer people will know that Bali has mass graves from the 1965-66 genocides, and indeed the colonial genocides before. Even the definition of ableism is different once you factor in colonialism's persistence. Here is Talila Lewis's definition for ableism, last updated January 2022, shaped alongside other disabled people of the majority world, and one that reflects my own understanding of ableism. Ableism, noun. A system of assigning value to people's bodies and minds based on societally constructed ideas of normalcy, productivity, desirability, intelligence, excellence, and fitness. These constructed ideas are deeply rooted in eugenics, anti-blackness, misogyny, colonialism, imperialism, and capitalism. The systemic oppression that leads to people and society determining people's value based on their culture, age, language, appearance, religion, birth or living place, quote unquote health or wellness, and or their ability to, satisfactory, to satisfactorily reproduce, quote unquote excel, and quote unquote behave. You do not have to be disabled to experience ableism. To Talila's definition, I, can, I imagine that one can add other words related to discrimination, such as casteism. This is a completely different understanding of ableism than that of disability rights, which conveys rights to citizens of a nation. Here is a definition that recognizes that disability justice is the way forward. Disability justice itself is a term coined by queer Crips of Color Collective Sins Invalid from North America with principles including anti-capitalism and recognizing present-day colonialism as an impediment to disability justice. When I say colonialism here in the UK, it is almost always regarded in terms of the past, the legacies of colonialism, the traces of colonialism, when this world is fundamentally built on colonial structures, felt presence. 
The United States, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand are all colonial states, and they are illegal occupiers of indigenous lands. Lands where people, including so many deaf and or disabled people, have been stewards of place for thousands of years and were met by genocide, by Europeans kidnapping their children for indoctrination in Christian boarding schools, by assault, and have survived. The taxes we pay to colonial states that cause bombings in Yemen and Palestine, as Jasper Pua writes, create deaf, disabled and deaf people in places that have been stripped of systems of care for them and cause further harm to people who are already deaf and or disabled. The body minds of all of us in the UK and of so many billions beyond are shaped by processes of colonial extractivism. So many of us texting with, eating, moisturizing, bathing with, and being furnished by materials procured via unjust ableist and genocidal practices. So Indonesia is the world's largest source of palm oil. Hectares of rainforest are destroyed and plantations that grow palms for palm oil are planted in place of it. This is a process that involves violently forcing indigenous people off of their lands, exploiting palm oil, wo oil workers, killing wildlife and also killing people. In 2015, the smoke from forest fires in Indonesia killed over 100,000 people. I recently met a German journalist who said he'd reported on it, but only covered orangutan deaths. Orangutan is an Indonesian word that means person or people of the forest. So every time you say orangutan, you're speaking Indonesian. <laughs> However, although Indonesians speak of them as people just like us, their lives are valued above ours in any environmental conversation in the West. And half of the groceries in our grocery stores contain palm oil, from cookies to shampoo to serums to detergent. Once again, there are hierarchies to the value of human life and the colonial obscuring and perpetuation of genocides. Genocides that hit deaf and or disabled people trying to protect the rainforests as hard as you can imagine. In every marginalized community, there is a higher percentage of deaf and or disabled people. There's been a lot of talk in the UK about decolonization. And to this, I consistently quote Eve Tuck and Kay Wayne Yang, who speak in a North American context. Decolonization brings about the repatriation of indigenous land and life. It is not a metaphor for other things we want to do to improve our societies and schools. The metaphorization of decolonization makes possible a set of evasions or settler moves to innocence that problematically attempt to reconcile settler guilt and complicity and rescue settler futurity. So what they're saying here is decolonization means actually giving lands back to indigenous peoples and dismantling colonial systems. You cannot decolonize an inherently colonial institution. And this rejection of colonization as the past is far from mine alone. This impulse is not new, nor of our making we the living. The impulse towards liberation is ancient. These structures of taking and taking again for the consumer new goods we need, bolstered by huge financial institutions, by colonial states that have the gall to impose enormous amount of debt on countries they have already stolen from, by people with so much ahistoricity that to them environmental and climate crisis is new rather than a continuation of what began in the 1500s with colonial extraction. These structures are ableist as all get out. They are built on ableism. They are built on the belief that it is fine to create carcinogenic nickel mines in Indonesia for our clean energy, that we can poison rivers with industrial waste and sell clean drinking water for a hefty price. Freedom means we are no longer subject to a definition of disability dominated by those least affected by ableism and least understanding of how intertwined transnationally we all are. And it also means the joy and liberation of people we will likely never come face to face with in our lives ever, but who we interact with daily, whose lives we influence simply by stealing from them. True joy for me, and I know many others, is existing in the body mind as uncolony the hope of one day doing so. For the next 10 seconds, imagine with me how it would feel in the body mind if all our lives were not built on theft and this absence of thieving as a warm glow inside us.
You may come back to the room. Part three, persistence, perpetuance. Throughout all of these genocides and tragedies, disabled peoples have been creating, making art to make sense of the world, sharing song and story and cloth and feasts. We looked for signs of the divine inside of each other. Radical organizing has been happening at every turn, which requires a rejection of colonialism in all its forms, which is difficult in this intertwined system of violence and requires the frequent checking in with ourselves with regards to our own privileges as well as what is required for our own safety and wellness, with the understanding that true safety is that achieved without extractivism. Once again, as disabled people, we are no strangers to systemic adversity. And as artists, for I believe we all are and have the capacity to create far beyond what society may tell us we can, we have been imagining futures far more just than this colonial present. This requires anti-colonial imaginations, and I am very much aware that I am somehow saying this in the colonial language of English. One definition of the difference between anti-colonial and decolonial that I like to give relates to museum artifacts here in the UK that belong to communities in what is now Indonesia. An act of decoloniality is returning these artifacts to the Indonesian government. But to be anti-colonial, we must recognize that those artifacts may not belong in the capital city of Jakarta, but with the local peoples that created them. And we must recognize, again, that Indonesia is a colonial state. The Nishnabeg activist Leanne Betasamo Sake Simpson's work reminds me that colonialism as an overarching project continues to fail since indigenous resistance has persisted. And it occurs to me that though colonialism has pummeled deaf and disabled cultures, many persist as well, including those within indigenous communities. We have witnessed it all and survived to tell the tale with everything our body minds know ancestrally. We are creating still and will create as long as we are here. And undoing these deep-rooted systems of colonialism in all its aspects is part and parcel of love, joy, laughter, kindness, loyalty, and care to each other. The creative spark we all have can be used to uproot the harm we are all complicit in causing. Deafen our disabled people in unions and collectives and organizing and community gardens and care circles of mutual aid and groups that reimagine healthcare and artists, artists, artists have been and continue to show us the way forward. True joy is when we know that the causes of our joy are not tied to any violence, any harm, any exploitation. And that is difficult when these systems we are in are of colonial capitalism, including in the arts, and indelibly tied to austerity here in the UK, are inherently built on exploitation. We must refuse to engage as much as possible and resist as much as possible this destructive impulse that is perpetrated by the grandchildren of the Dutch East Indies Company, the 100 or so corporations who would have us barreling forward into irreversible climate change, itself a colonial legacy, and to the very opposite of any spark of joy. But let us imagine that spark of true joy, one with the knowledge that we are in systems causing no harm to others, enveloping the world. A true joy that is built on building people up and not using them for parts. A joy that is not built on any kind of colonially created sense of superiority. Feel free to close your eyes again if you're sighted. And for the last time, let's meditate on that feeling once again of warm joy for the next 20 seconds. You may open your eyes. Thank you so much for spending this time with me. Thank you, Karani. That was very powerful. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot that uh, I'm sitting with, actually. Thank you for that. Um, we're going to take a break now for about 10 minutes. So yeah, 10 minutes. So um, uh, also, while we're taking a break, you might want to go to the second floor to actually see the Rushton bust um, at, here at the museum. Uh, so yeah, take a break and we'll be back. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you, And uh, we'll have the discussion after the break. Thank you.
Hi, everybody. I hope you had a nice break and have some questions for us. So this section um, is going to be a panel discussion and it's going to last about 40 minutes and then open to the floor for some questions. So please have some primed. <laughs> um, so I'd like to introduce um, two more guests um, onto the panel. So we've got Amini Atak, is that correct? Yeah. Um, uh, is a Yenemi artist, poet, sorry, let me start again. Yenemi poet, writer, performance, creative practitioner, and award-winning community activist. BBC Words first finalist, 2019 and a young associate anti-racist group member for Curious Minds. Artist Fellowship for Dada Fest, the Western Jerwood Creative Programme and Social Fellow of the Humbert um, Foundation Residency 2022. Um, we have uh, Rachel Yannico, Yannico uh, is a Liverpool-based management and strategy consultant um, uh, she uh, she uses strategic strategic thinking to facilitate productive, insightful conversations towards inclusive workplace places. Uh, her supportive approach helps develop programs that move and and uh, move from well intentioned to meaningful work practice. <laughs> She works with cultural and academic and charitable institutions across the UK. So I'd like you to welcome them to the panel as well. So can I get you to uh, describe yourself as well? Yeah. Okay. Do you want to start? Yeah, hi. Hi. <laughs> it's on. Sorry, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's cool. on. Just uh, describe yourself. Audio, describe oh, yourself. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't yeah. Know. That's okay. Um, yeah, so hello, everyone. Um, is it afternoon? Yeah, good, good afternoon. Uh, so I'm wearing, I always wear black. I love wearing black. It makes me, feel, it makes me feel mysterious. Um, so I've got a black blazer, um, a black polo neck, black pants, black boots, but then I put this um, checked scarf on um, around my neck. All right, and um, I have a pink scarf, pinkish scarf on top of a blue jacket, uh, black braids in my hair, and um, I've got black boots and red glasses. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> thank you. Um, so, yes, just want to thank you again for such a powerful um, lecture. Um, I was talking to people um, in the break and it was just like, it was like, boom, 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 and there's another thing, and there's another thing. So, um, I just wanted to bring you guys in and do you have any kind of initial thoughts or comments that you want to bring to the discussion to start to show? Sure, off? sure. I think it's uh, it's it, it's a fascin it was a fascinating lecture. There were so many ideas and so many things to consider. Um, so we're thinking like w w what where to start really, where to start um, and. I suppose really what I really like that you encourage us to keep resisting this system uh, that um, we inherited from uh, the colonial world and the colonial mindset um, and that is all around us all the time. So I'm wondering to keep going, to keep resisting in a way that is productive. When you ask us to, to think, try to picture what this reality could be, could you describe what it would be for you, this kind of post-colonial uh, space, post-colonial society where we rather learned from the encounter we had between culture rather than keeping stealing um, from other uh, societies and other groups? Um, I think, uh, I hope, first of all, I thank you all so much for uh, listening and, and for being here. And I'm excited to be in conversation with you, Amina and, and Rachel. Um, I, I think that it's, it's really difficult to be prescriptive about something as like vast as, you know, what would the world look like without systems based on theft. Um, so I think that's why I, I wanted us all to center it in 
a sense uh, that is embodied and it, what would it actually feel like if you can imagine a world where nothing that you own or eat or um, use is based on such um, violent theft um, and I think it, it's it's this imagining that has been the crux of all of previous anti-colonial struggles, right? That feeling, it starts from that feeling. And I think that's kind of something I wanted to return to. It's like, we're not alone in this. There have been millions and billions of people who've imagined that feeling and worked and, and you know, paid with their lives for, for that feeling. Um, I think, it, and it starts small and it, everybody has their own part. But again, I really wish people who had a lot more power, i.e. politicians and corporations would do more, right? to divest from, from these practices. Um, and what we can do as ordinary people, I think, is in our own lives to be mindful of that. And it, I think being, you know, being a, I was um, telling, I think, uh, Denise earlier, you know, like being conscious consumers is, is, yeah. is important, right? You know, choosing what products, you know, choosing to buy ethically, even though there's so much greenwashing around. Um, that's one thing, but it really is also about keeping pressure on, on people in power, in governments, and, and in business to, to stop um, uh, terrible practices and to help disabled people <laughs> live our lives, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Did, did you want to yeah, come I, Yeah, I, um, I had a lot of thoughts, and it was taking a lot of turns. Um, I was learning new things for the first time, especially about the historical kind of context of that theft in Indonesia, uh, but also just also th just the joy of the cultural heritage within Indonesia. So there was a lot, but I also think there was like there was a lot of things I started to think about the present, and then I started thinking, okay, do I wear the activist hat when I'm listening? Do I wear the artist hat, or do I just listen as a human? Right, because at the end of the day, I think it's a, it's a human response to this. So I, I, I wrote three questions, the past, like where does the past begin? Like how much do we go far out to start decon or become an anti-colonial, I can't say the word, the colonization, currently, or present, how much are we present that we are aware of this? And then in terms of the future, like how much structural power do we have to actually make change? Mm. And, I, and I started thinking of these things because it's thinking of Yemen and the British, because we were talking about intergenerational conversations. When I live with my grandmother, so we've got three generations in our family, my relationship with my grandmother and how we talk about the British being in the south of Yemen is very different. My grandmother refers to the British Empire as protectors. I refer to them as colonizers. So I feel like the battles sometimes are home. Yeah. And obviously that's embedded and so inherited that I can never change how my grandmother felt or feels. But when I did with Dada, I interviewed my grandmother and I asked her, why is it your hijab in this photograph is not in this, in this photo? And she said, because we weren't allowed to wear it crossing out of Aden. Wow. And I think for me, that was her trying to understand, oh, and remembering that actually, now that she has a choice to wear the hijab as an 80 year old woman, is realizing that actually, there is part of that journey that wasn't great. But because her thinking was that the British were protectors. So I guess I'm trying to think of that like present, like how much are we aware of it? Like, we, we can be aware of it, but what about my grandmother being aware of that, of that? And someone who actually passed the border while the British were on um, in the Aden region. So yeah, so three questions I started to think about. Oh, thank you so much for sharing that. And actually, um, so my granddad was Arab Indonesian and the largest migration from the Middle East to Indonesia was from Yemen. So I, I also feel like this, like a, there's all kinds of yeah generational ties to that region. Um, I think it, it, you know in Indonesia we say when we speak about the U.S. or the U.K. or Australia we say negara maju, which means um, progressed countries, like countries that have progressed. Like even that term, right? It's like negara maju, but it's like how did they progress? They actually stole from us to progress, right? That part is really it's this. 
it's it's so difficult to like divest people from thinking that and it also filters down to like in the indonesian government there's actually a ministry called the ministry for left behind regions which is so demeaning and so terrible um but that language comes from right like colonial government and thinking that there's like this hierarchy of like developed country developing country like how often do we hear developing country just or, to, or even think about that as people from developing countries, like in our families, using people using that language. Um, yeah, thank you so much for sharing. I think the battle is definitely at home, and it's so personal, right? Like with your grandmother and her memory. I think every old person, <laughs> you know, or every elder person, um, uh, has a different understanding of of how colonialism impacted them, impacted them at a very intimate level, and I think that's where art. It's really important in covering that. So thank you. Um, what, what what I was um, what struck me is that there are disabled gods. It's like oh. wow. <laughs> and can can you can you uh, expand on that at all? What 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 do they should protect? Um, what are the gods? Yeah. So speaking of like the colonized mind i knew my whole life that we had disabled gods but it didn't really hit me so i became physically disabled about 11 years ago and i and i then i started getting into like disability arts and academia and um meeting amex the colleague that i mentioned who's also a disabled academic in indonesia and he was writing specifically about this stuff and like this this um pre-colonial legacy and i was like oh shit, we have disabled God. <laughs> like, you know, it's something that you know your whole life, but until somebody tells you like, look, look at them, like they're disabled. This person is a little person. This person is, you know, this. And then also um, uh, looking at, I think he's been looking at like alternative and it, he made me think about alternative interpretations of, of stories in which, in which disability actually plays a lot of roles in not only Javanese mythologies, but in every mythology I started seeing it. You know what I mean? Like there are mythologies where like somebody um, becomes ill or, or loses a limb or something happens or they become quote unquote ugly, you know, they are quote unquote deformed, right? Like there are stories like this in every culture. And it made me really think like, oh, how can we reinterpret these stories or how have we been misinterpreting these stories? And how can we recognize that like there's in every mythology actually, <laughs> there's, you know, there's, there's an element of disability um, or, or an ideology there. Like even thinking like, oh, the, yeah, Hercules or whatever, like what is an ideal god, right? And are there gods that are less than that ideal or how do they figure into different mythologies? But yeah, there's all kinds of, um, Javanese mythology is really, a lot of it is comes from um, Indian mythology as well. Like, uh, cause the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, we have our own versions of that. So it's very much linked to Indian mythologies, but then mixed with indigenous beliefs as well. It yeah. kind of reminds me of like the fairy tales, like the, ri the original brutal fairy tales <laughs> of Hans, Gringer, Hans Christian Andersen. Um, uh, but they all seem to be, they seem to be negative. Are they, are they positive gods as well? Are they, are they there for, to do good things? Are we, are we revered in a good way or is it a negative way still? I think what's interesting is that all the gods have both good and bad in them. Okay. And in, there's a way in which like gods are human in that in that sense, and how you interpret them is also they exist in liminal spaces in a lot of these stories where you can interpret them any number of ways, which is what people have been trying to. That's what storytelling is yeah. for, right? And you know your own interpretation. And is, is this person is this god good? Is this god bad? Whose side are you on? So I think um, I think I think we're weirdly like having disabled gods humanizes us in that sense <laughs> did you do you have a do you have any any yeah I mean, come in? yeah yeah sure, please yeah. come in just <laughs> just chip in <laughs> yeah no on this uh, the spiritual aspect the spiritual model of disability in a way in comparison of uh, our uh, social model and medical model of disability i'm thinking how can we how can we make room for a different way of seeing disability in our society. In my work, I am supposed to help organizations trying to understand how they can find people with a specific experience. But if we cannot, if we cannot name them, if we don't have the same way of seeing, seeing the, the experience and naming them, how can we find them? 
And it, when I think about disability, in, in the UK we talk about learning disability, for example, that's very, very British. I have no idea who, uh, how someone coming from a different country would call that if they have in their family someone with learning disability. So how can we man make room for this unknown really? Yeah, that's a, 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 we were speaking on Zoom yesterday a little bit where we were talking about how like in French and in Indonesian, the words for disability are so, um, I'm not even going to attempt French. So if you could kindly <laughs> repeat what you what no, the I word said is. Uh, Handicapé in French, but that is, that is a French word, and I know that the translation of it in English would, be, would not be disabled, that would be handicapped, handicapped yeah, which yeah. is not the word that is used here, yeah. so that's, yeah. Yeah, so it's interesting too with Dada and, and arts organizations, you know, there's often like, I mean, I guess this is an international collaboration, I'm not British, you know, but, but different disability um, arts organizations in Indonesia or elsewhere, the, the conception of disability can be very different, right? So uh, a word that is widely used in our communities, in disabled communities in Indonesia for disabled is actually defable. We love acronyms. We will make an acronym out of anything. It's uh, really <laughs> annoying, I'm sorry. But like, so defable actually comes from the words differently abled. And disabled Indonesians were like, defable. <laughs> we're like, that's, that's our word, that's our word. We're gonna make it ours. And I actually refuse to use that word. Because diff I don't identify with that word differently abled, right? It's like, why are we the different ones? Like, wh why are we the point of difference from a norm, right? So I refuse to use this acronym defable, but my whole community uses it. So, you know, it's, it's difficult sometimes. I, and then I just say disabilitas, which is, you know, disability um, instead. But, but everywhere else, like including in like official. And another thing is that we're, a lot of us have been trying to change the, the government language because in a lot of the laws, it still says chat chat, which means deformed. And that is the official, uh, the, the, we've been trying to change a lot of the legal wording around this because it's, um, we don't like that word. Um, but some people use it and it's, some people use it proudly as well. I once, I met this, um, uh, I, uh, I was working with a disability arts organization in Australia and a man there came up to me and was like, I, um, or he was in the audience and he said, uh, I, I identify as being mangled. That's my word for myself, mangled. And that's such an extreme word. I would never use that word for myself, but there's a part of me that's like, maybe we should respect, you know, how people choose to name themselves. And that's a difficult thing because sometimes we may want to say, please don't use that word. But for some people, it's a reclamation, right? Like using the word queer or crip, it's a reclamation of an insult. Yeah. I, so that, that is also really interesting. And I think the fascinating thing right now is we're able to work cross-culturally and, um, and try and tease out those things. Because some people, I think, don't know that handicap is a bad thing, right? Yeah. So it must be interesting for you working back home, you know, like with that word. Um, and I actually wanted to ask, I wanted to ask all three of you questions. But one thing I wanted to ask Rachel is, um, you're a trauma-informed practitioner, mm -hmm. and I wanted to ask how that ties into your work as an arts consultant in terms of like generational trauma, colonial trauma, the stuff that Amina was talking about. Like, how would you, how would you include that? So approach? that's interesting that you ask me that because um, I, I, you probably saw that in my card visit, yeah. professional card, and someone advised me to remove that because that's a little intense to put like trauma-informed practitioner, but that's what I think is interesting in my work, is that I really recognize that all this conversation is difficult, yeah. is absolutely difficult, and we trying to, how, I, how that is part of my work is that in relation to disability, we find it absolutely normal to ask every day to people, do you have a disability? Do you have a protected characteristics? While, while most of the time that relates to some personal, intimate experience that is traumatic and we don't ask people their consent before to ask them those questions and they have to, they have to put everything on the table. Absolutely, if they want a chance to be able to work, if they want a chance to be able to be part of the community. So that is difficult, that historically has been difficult for us as living with one of those protected characteristics, uh, but it become difficult for everybody since 2020 
after the COVID, all this conversation became very, very public with the murder of George Floyd that became very public. And I really see people suffering, people who really, it's, it's really, really a painful conversation, even for people who don't have those characteristics to be exposed to this reality that they, they didn't realize how how painful it was and how life threatening it was is traumatic so um, it's very clear to me that in workplaces and and art setting in particular when you're here to talk about your experience we just like put trauma on the table yeah. and yeah <laughs> what do we do with that no honestly it's like i um i once was part of a a Q and A, and the f this man asked me, you know, what has your experience been with colonialism? Like first question, <laughs> like what? I mean, you know, <laughs> what a question. And I think often because we are in British society, we're othered, right? Like how we are othered becomes like, oh, they can talk about this as they can talk about being othered, right? Which is, you know, not what we as artists always want to talk about or need to talk about or like you know as often we're judged based on who we are rather than our art even though who we are is such a part of our art as well um and yeah i wanted to ask amina sort of how i'm also muslim and i i see you know like these conversations about do you find that do you find that you have the freedom to be an artist and and actually um speak about things like colonialism or trauma or these these generational histories on your own terms or do you think sometimes the narrative is kind of you know yeah. imposed from outside is that from a muslim perspective or anything uh, okay yeah. but also uh, yeah i'm um, curious okay so interesting because and i i was going to mention about the obviously you mentioned a few faiths that are um um, that are important to the Indonesian culture and also and I was, I was interested to see like because I used to separate being Muslim from being the artist or being the activist or being a brown woman because I, I always found that society either wanted me to either be Muslim or either wanted me to be either of them so it's like I had to kind of like adapt into this but then I'm like at the end of the day, I do have a Scouse accent. That that will never like wherever I go in the world, people will ask me about football. So I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, isn't the same thing with being Muslim then, right? Yeah, I yeah. can't separate that. I am Muslim as it gets. I might be a little bit more quirky in that, but and I wear black all the time. But I guess what I'm trying to say is like, I can't. You can't separate that. So answering your question, I think. I think there's so many layers. It's like an onion. There's so many. Honestly, it is like an onion, and it stings sometimes. And <laughs> but it's so many layers, and sometimes I'm like, what conversation is am I talking about today? So, and I was saying this before to Rachel. Like, we can't. We also have to think about intergenerational and conversations with our parents and our grandmothers, and that's a big part of my work as an artist. Yeah. And until I brought my faith into it, I realized that was the biggest gap I'd not, I'd really neglected. Um, and my faith had really connected some of these questions. Like for example, when we talk about disability within faith, we might not have the language that we have in a Western society, but we have compassion. Yeah. Like compassion is a big thing part of my faith. Well, and, and most faiths, well, all faiths really. And, so I guess for me, it's like, well, isn't that the thing, right? It's about being compassionate. We might have not the right language and we might use language that is not right, but there is compassion. And I know within the Muslim faith, you know, we have the same system that those who can't work, those who can't work for disability or learning difficulty, or those who are mothers or single mothers are exempt, yeah. you know, from sitting, even exempt from fasting on the um, month of Ramadan. And I was like, that's really compassionate, but why haven't I not been able to celebrate that and be joyful about it? Yeah. Yeah. Because 
obviously we're dealing with other things of being British and Muslim. And what does that mean in a Western society after 9-11? So I guess, I guess what I'm trying to say is that there are layers that I, can't, I haven't found answers to. But recently, I've just done a show with Dada called The Third House. And I said to myself, well, the past, I'm not a historian, and I try to understand as much as I can. There is some fragmentation in that. And a lot of my family don't, have never saved their papers. So some of these information I have to make up as well. And that feels really uncomfortable sometimes. But I guess the only thing I can do is I should give, we should give ourselves permission to build a new house too. And I think that place is for everyone, a place where like things just don't seem right now. Um, and building this house and writing a poetry collection for that, I was allowed to be Muslim. I gave myself to be fully Muslim. I allowed myself to be fully brown, to, to talk about colonization, but also just to celebrate, like, you know? And I guess, answering your question, there might be a lot of barriers, but I think as an artist, and we can move into the conversation of art, I feel free when I do art. And I think art has become a protector of that. I'm, being a poet, I've been able to protect all of these identities and I'm allowed to go wherever I want in it. So I guess when people ask why poetry, I'm like, because it protects me. So. Yes, I just got chills. Thank you so much. That's, Thank you that's so much. beautiful. No, yeah, no, and it's like. I don't know where that was going. Uh, no, no, 100%. And it's, um, yeah, about celebrating that. I think that a lot of able Muslims have this charity model towards disability, right? But like you say, there's so many elements like, um, like even like w when I do pray, I use like d dust ablution if I can't get to, you know, cause it's like you can do dust ablution if you can't get to water easily and things like that. Or like, I can't pr do prayer like I did when, before I became disabled, but I can do it, you know, like with my own movements, like sitting down or lying down or whatever. And that is to be celebrated. And we don't talk about that enough, like sort of um, how faith can, yeah, can help uh, because I think of what exactly what you said, there's this othering of the Muslim identity that is not often connected to the disabled identity here. Um, and I think what you said about also not, not celebrating that and because the scope study that said that the people who declare disability most are white people in the UK, even though British Asians are the, have the most like statistically and even though the worst impacted are black British people, I think a lot of that comes from the stigma that is already in our communities and other because we're dealing with so many other things like police states and immigration and you know poverty all of these layers that sometimes i think um disclosing disability on top of that God, yeah. is a lot for our communities right inside our communities so um but i think that's why it's important to understand that the racial and cultural component, it's not separate. It's actually, you can't understand disability in the UK or anywhere without understanding that component of it. Um, or understanding, yeah, that just the interlinkages between everything and that it's not something separate, but it, it, it should really be the bedrock of how you understand disability is, is the definition of ableism that Talila um, uh, and colleagues said that I agree with, which is that it's connected to these colonial ideas of what is a good body. Yeah. But also, it can affect everybody with that definition. It's not just about being physically or, you know, disabled. It's at any point in your life, you would experience ableism. It, that's my interpretation anyway, yeah, from yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I just wanted to move, move on to the, a line that you said is colonialism beget more colonialism. And I just thought it was interesting because I ever thought of um, like like Indonesia being a colonizer. And then I was thinking about my diaspora and it's like, oh yeah, that that's also true, being yeah. Niger you know, from a Nigerian descent. It's like, yeah, there are we are we've we've also taken on the tropes of the former colonizers. Um, so, so can you just elaborate a bit more on you know, the, the colonization of Indonesia within, the, uh, within yeah, that, that area. And it's also often related to natural resources. So, Pap so the island of Papua, half of it is Papua New Guinea, right? That's his own country. 
The other half is West Papua, that's Indonesia, but we are colonial occupiers of that region. And that is where the largest gold mine in the world is. And it is protected by the military, right? And it is very difficult to get proper media in there because there's a genocide, you know, like it's really, um, and of course there's the largest gold mine in the world and around it, poverty, <laughs> you know, because that's how it works. So th it's really, um, I think it's, it's difficult to say, I think with any citizen of any country, you recognize that the country you pay taxes to or are a citizen of also commits horrible acts, right? <laughs> um, for the most part. Um, and that's certainly true of, of Indonesia. And we're also like tying it back to climate change and debt and everything. Like there is a push for the government to amass all these natural resources in colonizing ways because we are under so much debt. Because, you know, the IMF, the World Bank, these Bretton Woods institutions, they um, subjected quote unquote developing countries to SAPs or structural adjustment programs. And that involves mass privatization, right? Mm -hmm. The gutting of public services and mass debt to quote unquote develop that country, right? And so, you know, you're asking people to pay back this debt so they, the government feels like they need to mass these natural resources in violent ways. And you're asking people to do that in a situation where like climate change is a, is a thing, but at the same time people, it's, it's very, um, and also, so when, when Suharto was still in power, he, uh, the general who was um, the, di uh, uh, the dictator, he had this program called Transmigrasi or Transmigration, wherein because Java is the most densely populated island and it's the colon <laughs> where the colonizer island, right, where, it's where the capital city Jakarta is, he, he basically sent people to colonize other parts of Indonesia and settle there to become basically settler colonial people. And that created a lot of conflict, like civil conflict wars, you know, because people are taking other people's land, basically. So that is a whole thing um, to do with the environment. Also, there, there's like a whole lot there, but yeah. Wow, yeah. So yeah, colonialism begets colonialism. <laughs> Do, do you have, uh, we've got a couple more minutes and then I'm going to open it up to the audience. So think of some questions. <laughs> do you want, do you want to come in to me? I was just thinking about, a lot of people think colonization is like, a, sometimes like a physical theft, like you have to be there. But really it's, you know, the big conversation now is about obviously selling arms. Mm. And you know, and even though now the discussion in Yemen is such a big thing and people are like, oh no, you know, though where, whatever, whether the, uh, the Yemeni people, the older generation, think the British were protectors or not. I'm like, well, the British may not be there anymore, but their arms are there. And they're not, they might not be stealing from your land, but they're definitely stealing lives because that benefit of arms is definitely killing people. So I guess we, are, we also have to start talking about like modern colonization and what colonization and what that looks like. Um, I don't know what that looks like, but I do know that arms trade sits in that. Um, trafficking yeah. is a big one. Mm -hmm. um, this idea, even just as simple as the fact that I have a British passport going to other countries, I would be treated, I would get a better pay, but even though someone who's qualified to say someone who's Yemeni can't pass borders freely, that as a privilege just to pass borders is, you know, is, is interesting. So yeah. Yeah. I'm just talking about like what's that future of colonization and how do we yeah, like yeah and like as I said like half of our grocery stores is with palm oil which I don't think you can have sustainable palm oil like I the it's just you it, it, it involves a lot of deforestation and a lot of killing of people so I try and be palm oil free because it's like um it's it, capitalism creates more and more steps between your life and the person directly involved in like making the materials and like farming and you know i can't name i can't name everywhere that the pla the things in my fridge came from you know <laughs> like I, I don't understand like what those processes are i don't know who these people are um but they're not always treated fairly so i think having a more like place-based ethos as well you know supporting local businesses supporting you know actually understanding where you get your your food from your things from um, and unfortunately we live in a world where like a lot of people just can't afford to, to, to get 
things other than what's at the grocery <laughs> store, right? Yeah. So, you know, there's that as well. Um, uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, we were talking yesterday about how um, a lot of disab disablement uh, is due to war now, isn't it? You know. Do you want to expand on that? Yeah, um, simply um, preparing for, for today and, and meeting with you and hearing your, your lecture, I did my little research around, uh, around thinking, the new thinking around disability and, and found this information that I never thought about before that most of the disability around the world is created by war, that we, we never think about the connection with like war in the world, but war creates, absolutely creates disability. Uh, and that's another aspect of disability that we never, we never consider um, really. And it's, yeah, it's just a big part of it. Yeah, and I, yeah, I just thought it's interesting, you know, with the Yemen, Yemeni connection and just like yeah. the genocide, you know, the, all of, you know, it's just destruction, isn't the it? The theorist you know? I um, quoted from Jasbir Poor, her book, The Right to Maim, is about basically how, you know, in the West there's like measures to make things more accessible, but at the same time, as mentioned, our taxes go towards creating more disabled people in places where there's no health care or support infrastructure. So if you, you know, I mean, it's really hard to like label, okay, what is, what is making what more accessible if that same act of making something more accessible is part of a system that is creating a very much non-accessible situations elsewhere. Um, and how like there's, and that's why, you know, disability rights is about the rights of people within a country. But what about, you know, disabled people rejecting that country's, you know, bombings and our arms, you know, providing arms in places like Yemen or in Palestine, you know, it's um, the interconnectedness of disabled people is something that, that her work made me think about a lot. So, yeah. Thank you. That's brilliant. Um, let's come to the end of the discussion parts. So just want to open it up to the audience. Does anybody have a question? I know it's a huge, the, dis the lecture this morning, my goodness, it was huge. The We've got one at the back. Brilliant. Can you introduce yourself as well? Can you introduce yourself uh, as well? Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kuda. Uh, we're just here visiting Liverpool. Uh, apologies, we're gate crushers. No, uh, you're wel <laughs> very welcome. And, uh, and we did miss uh, maybe a big chunk of the earlier discussion or conversation. Um, it's been quite an interesting topic. But I think something that I was just wondering was, you know, um, are victims of colonialism maybe likely to become perpetrators or colonizers themselves, you know, at some point? Great know, question. It's a, it's a bit of a strange question. No, no, it's a great question. No, it's not. Thank you for gate crashing, and I hope you enjoy the cookies. <laughs> um, uh, absolutely. So as mentioned, the, uh, in my lecture, I mentioned I was born into a dictatorship. I'm Indonesian, and the dictator was named Suharto, General Suharto, and he was actually born very poor. And we, there's a saying that, you know, uh, we say that his dictatorship was the revenge of a poor boy. Because he was so, so poor when he was little. I think psychologically he was like, okay, I'm out to get people and I don't care who dies or, you know, like what happens? Like, it really, I, it, I think it came from a deep psychological wound, right? And that poverty was caused by colonialism, right? Because we were colonized by Europeans for hundreds of years. And in, there was, um, as mentioned, like we were enslaved. There was slavery in Indonesia for 200 years. So it is this, this kind of vicious cycle. Um, and you see that I know people in Indonesia who have been very poor and then when they get their money, they colonize, essentially colonize other people, right? By treating workers unfairly or, you know, like causing environmental destruction somewhere. Um, I think the psychological aspect is so fascinating. I'm sure Rachel as like a trauma-informed practitioner knows a lot about this, like the psychological aspect of, of, of having been stolen from and then also <laughs> stealing <laughs> in the system, you know, it's just, it's, it must be very interesting. Yeah, I don't know so much about this specific question, but I think that makes me think about, you know, those children who would be uh, abused as children are more likely to abuse their children. That really makes me think about that. Um, 
in, in a sort of a endless circle of yeah and that is where and i don't know if i i don't know how to explain the link the connection i'm making right now but i think this is where art is so helpful and the work that you do on language as artists to help us expand our expand the limits of our imaginaries you know and the limit of what we can see and what we the limits of of the experience we had or we have um, and what what new society new world uh, we can create i really rely on artists to give me some ideas of like okay that's that's our experience it's really not satisfying but what else so yeah i don't know if that's that answers your question but yeah uh, i just want to add on to that but from a different angle and just say in this vicious circle there are people who are you know fighting that and amongst these people are women mainly are disabled people uh, and i guess it's just a reminder that those people who are fighting are, the, are also those who are most marginalized and we see that through our history any type of like social movement it's always women disabled people every marginalized group always fighting and counterproductive and it's still happening today so i guess just a reminder that because it does seem a bit overwhelming when we talk about this like how are we going to break that cycle and i think it's about you know having more social activists and being a part of that movement to break that cycle imagining the joy in our bodies <laughs> yeah the joy and the compassion you are talking about i think compassion whatever how you call it in your language in your how you feel it but compassion is really helpful to not re-traumatizing other and yeah excellent yeah definitely does anybody else have a question you must have a sneaky one yes hi thank you i'm janet price um Really, um, I, I'm just, my, my head is buzzing. That was really wonderful and really exciting. And I'm so full of ideas. And thank you all for your, your feed in. Um, sort of following on just from what Aminu was saying, um, I think we have to recognize that our activism can happen in all sorts of ways. And as you were saying, you know, there are so many women involved now. I've just come from, um, Granby Market, local community market, and there's a stall there run um, to support the children's hospital in Sanaa in Yemen, which is the only pediatric. So if you can support the kids to not become disabled at that age, and it's a bunch of Yemeni and Somali and other African women and other Liverpool women, white, black, brown, and it's joyous. It is the most joyous thing I know of in my month, and I really look forward to it. And it does it 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 is activism at its core because the women learn from each other they teach each other they share with things this will be shared with them all and it this wasn't at all what i was going to say but i think it's it's to the point about you know what are those day-to-day -day acts we can take that counter all of this and i think it's so enormous and the distress you can feel can be so massive that you can be just stymied into doing nothing. So I think finding those points where you can act in community with others in a way that gives you joy, but that challenge, because joy and pleasure and laughter are things that challenge the people who think they have the power. You can laugh at them, it breaks them down they suddenly become far less powerful. And, and to do that with a bunch of women is the most joyous thing of which I know. Yeah, absolutely. So completely not what I was going to say, no. but <laughs> no, no, <laughs> so, thank so you, interesting yeah. to, I mean, where, where do you find your moments of joy in activism? Do you want to start, Amina? Yeah. Um, uh, my, well, my grandmother's not here or my mother, but I'm going to be truthfully honest. There are things that my parents do and my grandmother and 
those that I have to detach myself from. And I think that's the only time where I will feel like I can definitely implement change. And when I say that is like, and we were saying this before, like in that migration journey, your parents did not consent, did not give consent to their children whether they want to be moved. Mm. So for me, I carried that anger like to my parents. Mm. Well, why did you move me? Mm. Right? <laughs> and that goes along to many journeys. But then it's like you then become the guardian for your parents because then you become a translator yes. whilst being a child. Yeah. And then you're out in the world trying to figure out what that means. So I guess for me, that joy is trying to say, okay, I've done all of that. And now I'm taking a big break and I'm, I'm giving it back to myself and detaching myself from my parents and my grandmother and my family. And that's not a bad thing. It's trying to say, look, the certain thing that you do, that's not going to be helpful for the future to come. And um, detaching sometimes is, is where I, I find joy. Oh, joy. Um, I, I don't know. I find joy in lots and lots, lots of things. Uh, but I think what makes me, I absolutely love what I'm doing. And I think what I love the most is when I see that people I'm working with can see the value of our feelings. Can, and, and I know because I work in the business mode and I work with really boring stuff like goals and targets and stuff like that, it's, it's all about figures and and it's really difficult to put a number against a feeling, a number against a trauma, a number against a positive thing. It's really, really difficult. So I'm so happy when I can see and I can feel that the organization or the person I'm talking to absolutely sees a value in whatever term they, they think of all this conversation uh, at at a human level, just for us all. Um, yeah, that's what bring me the most joy, probably. Gus, you want to uh, go? I don't know. I don't know. Um, I suppose collaboration with, because I my my practice is mainly um, photography. So it's when you when you find a collaborator that want that shares your vision and shares your kind of. Um, the way you see something, I think, yeah, that gives me joy. And then also, I love and hate people at equal measures. Being on my own sometimes just gives me joy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks, yeah. For me, um, likewise, take a lot of joy in a lot of things, comedy, food. Uh, food is a big one. Um, I think connection, like moments like this, I think um, for a lot of my life I was disbelieved about a lot of stuff and continue to be a lot of people don't believe you're in pain yeah. especially in hospitals especially yeah. in clinical institu uh, institutions and a lot of it is related to the racism of brown and black people are not seen as being in pain um, and I and even with people who are also disabled sometimes they will not believe that you know they don't because it's quote-unquote hidden disability or whatever mm -hmm. and that's really isolating it's super isolating and there's this sense also of crip normativity which is crip normativity is when you you think that being disabled is a one certain way right and it's like there's infinite varieties of body minds and conditions are fluid and you know like there's so much going on inside us and speaking about translating every day as a disabled person you have to try and translate what you're feeling inside to other people right like do i need to lie down like, like all of this stuff it can be quite agitating but connection sort of when you're just in the flow and you're just being accepted as a person and you're accepting other people as people, you know, and, and being in a warm and supportive environment, in contrast to all the other stuff that I've had to deal with, it, that is, I love that, I love this. <laughs> yeah. cool. um, we have time for one more question and then we'll have to end this brilliant discussion. Do we have a question? Hey, yes. Yeah. 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 Hi. Um, sorry, I am meant to be working, but this no. is just far too interesting for me not to comment. <laughs> <laughs> so there's two things. One of them, um, when you were talking about the different words that different cu cultures and countries have for disability. Um, so earlier on this week, I actually found out that a lot of the um, Middle Eastern countries refer to their disabled people as people of determination 
which I fell in love with. I was like, that is absolutely amazing. And like, could we adopt that here? <laughs> so yeah, people of determination. Um, so that I had, I did know there was an organ, um, a Saudi Arabia based organization called the people of determination. And I just assumed that was the name they'd given themselves, but actually it's the general term used across a lot of the Middle East. Um, so that was really encouraging. And the other question I've got is um, around this kind of mindset and adoption of um, colonial thinking and attitudes. So I'm um, born British, black, from uh, Caribbean um, heritage. Um, and I've got a lot, a lot of African friends who are kind of first generation here. And just listening to their stories about, so things like just the fact that they've stepped foot on British soil and when they go back home are treated like kings and queens because they've, they've touched the British earth or whatever it is. And it is just a continuation of those colonial mindsets where, I mean, the British Empire has been telling everybody for hundreds of years that it's the greatest, it's the best that our way is the most valued, is the most productive. And seeing that carried through um, people that, and places that they've colonized, um, to me, anyway, I, mean, I find it all quite upsetting that simply speaking English, having visited England, suddenly makes you superior to the rest of your, of your kinfolk. Do you have any ideas about how to combat that sort of um, kind of attitude generally like because it is it's our aunties our uncles our grandparents our great-grandparents it's, it's our families who were thinking that that's how I ended up here you mean my my grandfather cho choosing to migrate from Jamaica to the UK for this quote-unquote better life that's how come we have such high immigration because we've been telling Britain I say we that's weird <laughs> but yeah we the British Empire have been telling the world for generations that we are the best it's amazing I mean everything else is much lower than us and then we have this influx of we've taught everybody how to colonize and now it's kind of come back tenfold and that people are making their way here because they believe the hype <laughs> how do we get over that i think people and I, I know people in indonesia artists are doing amazing work that just even a single painting or a single you know something else that sort of shatters these myths again mm -hmm. art is always you know such an amazing way forward um, uh, the theorist and writer Ngugi Wa Tiongo, I think I'm mispronouncing his name, the Kenyan author, he has a book coming out called The Language of Languages, which is like a collection of his lectures and stuff, but he um, s wrote in English and then at some point in his career he stopped writing in English as an anti-colonial act and he's, he wrote and he writes now solely in Kikuyu and everything is translated into English, like that, to, things like that um, Everybody can do their own part, but I 100% agree with it because it's the same in Indonesia. It's like, oh, you're in the UK and you speak English and it's, it's elevated. Whereas like our indigenous cultures and languages are way more sophisticated, like in terms of thinking about disability and in terms of like the cosmology. Um, yeah, the world, we have a saying like, dunia tidak selebar daun kelor, like the world is not as why does a kelor leaf, you know, like, like people think it's, there's a whole universe is outside of English and the way English shapes your mindset. Um, but yeah, I don't know if anyone. Uh, I, I don't know, because I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> and it's also, you, you speak English, but you speak proper English, you know, because, you know, it's, you, you know, my family speak English, but it's, you don't have an accent. So it's, it's that, it's also that as well that goes into it. Um, I, I don't know, I just suppose it's, it's that constant just correction, but with love, you know, it's like, no, that's not right, you know, I, I'm just like you, really, you know, and um, it, yeah, it is, it's, it's hard because they still are, have the mindset of colonialism, and whereas we've moved on and we don't agree with it and we don't think it's right, they still kind of, maybe because it was a better world that they lived in back then like you know in the 60s and 70s it's 
you know, there was more prosperous. There wasn't so much, especially from Nigeria, there wasn't a war, you know, when, when the British left. And then after the British left, it was, there was a civil war. So I don't know. It's, 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 there's, there's a thesis in that. There's a doctorate in that. <laughs> that obscuring of the colonial violence as well. Exactly. It's like the yeah. amnesia yeah. about, about exactly. that. I think I would agree with them and say, yes, absolutely, you're, you're right, and talk about all the stuff in the United Kingdom that come from a different country. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, this is like most of the wealth in this city, in this country, come from somewhere else. So yes, it's a great country. It's a great empire. It's, yeah, and just reminding them because I mean, coming from a different country, I understand what it is when you, you just the exotism, oh my God, England, like, you know, it, it sounds amazing um, because it's different, because it's different. But I think recognizing that they can see what we struggle with, I think, in, 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 in Europe is to see the value in other countries. We really, really struggle with that really struggle with just saying, oh, wow, that's, that's great. That is, that is valuable. It's all about the value of Europe and, and capitalist way of seeing things. Um, so yeah, I would, yeah, stress the values in the country where you come from, what you're, the one you're talking about, um, and, and remind them that Europe is just like a just yeah, one just tiny stole <laughs> everything. <laughs> one tiny story is that a friend of mine visited from Indonesia for the first time here, and she went to Buckingham Palace, and she was like, it was pretty small. <laughs> she was like, everybody makes up this giant thing, like, this is Buckingham Palace. It's like, in Indonesia, we have, like, the largest Buddhist temple in the world. We have, like, gigantic temples. And she was like, why is everything about Buckingham Palace? Like, this little building? Like, what? What is this? Anyway, yeah, sorry. Amina? Um... <sighs> I, I oh. okay. The thing is, right? We still make this country great because we contribute in it mm. as well. So, and this is where I find conflict in how I talk about my British identity, because without the hard working of marginalised communities the country wouldn't be what it is today. And we, it's been proven throughout even COVID with like the lack of health workers and all that. And so I guess I'm, I, I am still challenged what that means because this country did make me also bilingual. It also made me, you know, it taught me my first words of English. It taught me to make friends. It taught me, you know, a lot of things. So I guess in that joy is actually saying, you know what, I'm still a part of this place. And I guess it's going back to that past, present and future and saying, look, we need all stories. And I think in the art that I create, I've made space for that. I've made a space for my grandmother's story and I've also made space for mine. So that way it's not about just what my grandmother thinks. It's also what I think today too, but also what the past thinks as well or what the past tells us. So I guess it's making room. And part of that room is about being platformed so it's about systematic, understanding how systematically how we enter these spaces. So, and this is where allyship comes in and, um, and I think co-collaboration is the most powerful thing you can ever do. It's about enriching each other's lives. And I think when we use words like this, enriching and you know, words like joy, it kind of brings us to a place of like, you know what, we can talk about the past and we can all have a human response to it. It's not just, you know, a certain type of community that needs to talk about it. So I actually asked my dad, can I play it? It's only a few yeah. seconds. So I asked my dad the question that I was going to be asked today. And I said, dad, and he's quite open about being, having Asperger's, um, but he got diagnosed quite late of his years. And I said, dad, uh, what's your joy? Like, what does it feel like? So, Whether it's so from uh, different minorities, different races um i think to be quite frank with you i think it comes down to um um to giving people a chance to speak so so, so uh, he said a lot of things but i guess i want to end it there to say it's about giving everyone a chance to speak 
and yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks to Dad. Yeah. So I just heard my dad no. was like, can you share it? Yeah, that's brilliant. <laughs> no, I love it. Tell him that, yeah, that was brilliant. So I, that is the perfect uh, place to end this discussion, the Rushton Lecture. So I want to thank Kayani Barker, uh, um, Amina Ati, and Rachel Yan. Yaniko, so I nearly got it. Sorry. Uh, thank you all, and thank you to you as well for being in the audience. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks to our amazing interpreters. Thank oh, you. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>